So, Okay. And I can tell you right away what this uh, one particle irreducible is. So, we already saw that disconnected simply means two diagrams that do not talk to each other, right. I can have, but I can simultaneously have something else going on here, okay. So, this is and so there is a multiplication between the two. but they are disconnected. Connected diagrams can be of three types. And for uh, argument's sake, I am taking some from some book, but this is of course connected because everything is connected to everything. Then we have no specific theory I am writing, but I am just drawing some graphs like graph theory. These are all connected, but the point is we say oh this only has a two point function on the on the external leg. that just gets reinterpreted as the if you that just gets reabsorbed into the mass of the particle. We just say the correct propagator is such that these things are all absorbed into the. So, whatever higher order effects generate things like this where there are only two external legs, we just reabsorb it into the propagator and we do not consider it as new physics. This thing is such that it can be cut into two. Okay, so, becomes disconnected by cutting one line. So, we do not like this, we say that it is too simple, okay. but this last one is what we call one particle irreducible. One particle meaning one line, something that cannot be made disconnected by cutting one line is called one particle irreducible.
any one internal line. So, for this reason it is useful to keep track of what is connected, disconnected and what is one particle irredu irreducible and uh, it also goes to the core of this uh, locality and cluster decomposition. So, if, if physics is local ultimately then you want that if you start with a larger Green's function, G, uh, end point function and if I separate first 5 and the next 7 particles and send them far away it should just become product of a 5 point and a 7 point Green's function. That property is assumed of, uh, so it can be proved that so long as you write your Lagrangian as local products of fields and derivatives. just to not uh, stress you with <coughs> unbalanced Lorentz indices, some things like this, okay, products of is just a generic example of prod so this has one field and two derivatives, but you could have powers of you know you just make it square if you like, so that it is no charges are hanging. But the point is so long as this is a product of at the same space time point. So, I will not try to write the um, definition of cluster decomposition because to be precise one has to write a lot, but you got the idea that if I separate out particles then they become products of individual uh, scatterings. So, this kind of locality of the theory again goes back to uh, the possibility that higher order Green's functions contain products of lower order ones, but they are just nuisance, they are because of, they follow because after all it is a local field theory. And the only non-trivial thing that we have to worry about uh, while renormalizing is to worry about the one particle irreducible diagrams, that too there will not be too many of them. If there are too many of them then you are sunk in the sense that you have a large number of uh, unrenormalizable terms. and. Uh, the theory reduces in its ability to predict. At present we have theory of pions and nucleons in terms of what is called a chiral Lagrangian and this chiral field theory is uh, you have to include all possible higher order terms consistent with symmetries of the theory and each coefficient then gets renormalized if you do higher order uh, scattering. So, you have to just determine each coefficient by doing scattering at the required energy and so it is predictivity goes because you cannot predict what the coefficients are. So, if the theory has only finite number of one particle irreducible diagrams ne needing renormalization then you have a renormalizable theory and then you have a uh, lot of predictive power like the standard model has 
which, which gives us confidence to build a machine like LHC. Okay. So, those are the advantages of this and that is why this kind of formalism is developed. So, now you may ask, so last time we introduced uh, what is called effective potential and that is what we are going towards now or effective action. So, so far we got a functional which is a functional of some auxiliary thing j. So, what do we deal with? What are we dealing with? So, instead of w of j, we would like gamma phi a functional of space time field phi which can have such that we get the dual interpretation. by which I mean class expectation value, right. Vacuum expectation value of the quantum field phi. So, we want to construct an energy fun and that gamma has a interpretation of governing the dynamics of phi. So, in particular we expect to recover uh, S of ordinary phi, the ordinary action of the ordinary phi as the lowest order, the 0th order approximation in gamma. I should not write gamma 2, but whatever. Okay, so, so, this is what we would expect. If there is no quantum, if there are no quantum corrections, then the field theory should just remain classical field theory. You, the, we will see. So, if you do the quantum action principle for the that is this gamma for our free field theory, we will simply recover the same equations of motion for the correctly defined classical field which can now be interpreted as vacuum expectation value of the quantum field. Okay. So, we are in search of such a formalism and of course, gamma will have gamma will be of the form uh, T minus V, where T is kinetic term, but I should say kinetic and derivative terms. And V a polynomial I, well, power series in phi alone. Hmm. 
not the derivatives. So that is what we call the potential and this is what we call the effective potential. So this is called effective action and this is called effective potential. Because if you deal with uh, so after you construct this, so these are exactly like like I have been trying to say uh, <coughs> in thermodynamics you have some gas and whatever complicated dynamics it has, the variables that you see for the gas as a whole are pressure, volume, temperature, etc. Volume is an extensive parameter, if you uh, change, if you add something then the volume also increases. Pressure is only local, it does not, if you have more gas the pressure at that point does not change. So those are intensive versus extensive variables and you can construct free energy of the system and ask what is its dependence on volume. So this phi acts like some kind of an extensive variable, you ask for it, ask for the dependence of field on, well this is an intensive variable, you ask for its dependence on this particular collective variable phi and it, it, it tells you the answer, if you switch off the derivatives then it tells you the energy it has and it can be then thought of as a question of suppose I constrained my phi to acquire a part, it need not even be a vacuum, I could just take, uh, so typical plot of V effective is something like this. Okay. What this means is, this is the minimum, this will be actually the vacuum expectation value because that is where V is 0. So we take this is how it is done right, you, whoever has seen simple examples of symmetry breaking and so on, you vary with respect to phi and wherever you find minimum that is the vacuum expectation value. You may ask what are the, what is the meaning of this part of the curve, well the answer is suppose I constrain my phi to have this value, somehow I arrange it because after all I have that external current J in hand. So I could crank up the J in such a way that phi gets this value, what will be the energy of the system for that value of phi. So we trade the auxiliary variable J for the actual physical variable phi, then we can ask such questions and then we can constrain the value of phi to be where we like or we can make it both space and time dependent, then we will have an action for it and we can ask if my phi has this particular space time behavior what is the value of the action and so on. So that will be the meaning of that. So the question is how do we go from this description W of j to gamma of uh, phi and it is a very interesting and elegant mathematical connection because it uses the Legendre transform. What we observe is that uh, sorry the two point function that we had is something that has uh, two phi's in it, g2 is expectation value of two phi's. So somehow if we vary this g with respect to phi once we should have information corresponding to one phi left, okay. So the way this is done is we start, uh, so I will now try to follow the calculation I have. So we go back to this uh, free theory example, uh, so we have to motivate firstly what this phi is, okay. So we take this W of j which is W0 times e raise to minus i times this propagator i over 2 times 
integral d4 x1 d4 x2 uh, j x1 delta of x1 minus x2 times j of x2. Now we see that if I do dw by dj then I get down uh, minus i over 2 integral d4 x2 and this is x1. So, <coughs> n times the wj back. Therefore, we divide out by w0, we had that little annoyance there. So, now we divide out by w0. So, now we say therefore, uh, 1 over wj times d by dj of w that is carrying this to this side which becomes d by dj of log of w and remember log of w we define to be z aside from an i one should put an i there. So, I can put i here from the beginning. So, I will put supply a there is a minus i here. So, yeah. So, I, if I keep i in the denominator that is bad. So, let us do this and that will produce correctly. Uh, it will remove the minus i uh, and that would leave a minus sign does not matter what we will leave that sign it is ok. Okay. So, it is equal to minus d by dj of z, but now we note that that box plus m square acting on delta was equal to minus delta 4 and therefore, uh, this x 1 we can write, but since it is a symmetric function I can even write x 2 in anticipation of what we are going to do here this expression is a uh, yeah so x1 is fine correct so if i this thing is <coughs> a function of x1 it's a functional of a function of x1 so if i hit this now which is i mean re, this refined one the one without the w so if i therefore box x plus m square x1 plus m square on this I may withdraw the minus sign later by changing the convention, but right now to avoid. Okay, so, if I hit it with this then this you know is nothing but what is in this curly bracket this box plus m square can be carried inside the x 2 integral it will produce a negative delta function here remove this minus sign and uh, yeah and leave behind j right and set it equal to x1 with perhaps an i left over certainly it is proportional to j of x1 this is uh, 
and I have to decide whether there is an I or I have lost track of what sorry what is happening here. Uh, my book says minus I right. So, this is the correct expression. So, we will define there is no I anywhere because I put an I over here um, and that tallies correctly with this definition right because we set w to be equal to e raise to i times z. So, very good. So, I am going to now announce that this expression is what I call phi classical. because indeed that is the one that was going to obey this Klein Gordon equation. The from the original uh, action which was k g action what is the equation of motion we get well we get box minus m squared box plus m squared phi equal to minus g I guess. Uh, how do Euler Lagrange equations work? So, we get d, so we get a minus d l by d phi aside from the first term d by d of d l by d d right equal to 0. So, if I put this here I would have got minus j here, so I get plus j here, so this is fine right. So, when I have this, this is exactly what should be called phi, phi classical. So, phi classical is nothing but variation of that log of the w with respect to the external current carry out. Uh, so, now what we do is we declare this phi to be the real vari the actual variable in terms of which I want to deal with the theory and I want to throw away the j. So, what we do is we do a Legendre transform. So, we define <coughs> gamma of phi to be where phi classical x is d z by d j. Now, here we have to remember. So, phi classical equal to aside from a minus sign later the minus sign disappears. So, I mean in uh, Ramon's book the minus sign is not there. So, how do I get rid I will call this minus phi classical here. <laughs> so, so, I want this definition. So, phi classical is just dz by dj. Um, right and the meaning of this expression is that this gamma is a functional of phi, but you see here j's. The point is wherever you see j you have to invert this equation. So, this implies that j of phi So, we have an expression phi classical equal to which will come out to be an expression in j, z is a sum functional of j. So, if I vary with respect to j I will have some functional of j. I have to invert this and express j in terms of phi classical and then plug that j everywhere. So, this j and this j will be this j substituted there that is when gamma will be defined in its correct domain phi classical right. This is the usual Legendre transform trick, but that is what we are now going to propose. So, now we can see we can actually prove that 
we recover the effective action we will recover by systematically plugging this in we will exactly get what we expect we will get just s because there are no quantum corrections and it is in two steps so in the present case we check the utility of this in the free case we find gamma of phi so first i have to write z of j but z of j was nothing but uh, minus j delta j right that is the z j and i have to write minus integral j phi symbolically this is the starting point but j is nothing but i substitute from here j is box plus m square acting on phi so that is the process of re expressing j in terms of phi classical so here instead of having to quote invert this and all that we can simply read this equation backwards to express j in terms of phi classical and this will be 1 phi 1 and then delta 1 2 and then box 2 plus m squared times phi 2 right in shortened notation that's what the first term becomes and minus again j phi i replace by box plus m squared phi times phi this will be 1 and this will be 2 but well they are local they are the same so i don't have to do 1 and 2 so if we make this act on the delta we will get a delta function because there are sec this is second derivative if we transfer both derivatives in succession the sign will not change and it will act on this but that will produce a delta 4 function and that will set the two uh, that will set the argument the same for both so what i'm saying is that this can be reduced to being simply phi box plus m square phi with all one okay i'll do it in a minute with a with a half factor but the second one and um, minus delta function so this will become plus half and there is a minus this same thing yeah but we do it twice because it's a second order diff derivative so that sign doesn't change and so we will recover exactly half but with a sign aside from a sign we will just recover the classical action so now let us just see what we are saying over there i think all of you got the idea but let us write it out so what we are claiming is that if i have integral uh, d4x1 d4x2 box 1 plus m1 squared uh, box 1 plus m square uh, phi 1 
times this delta 1 2 and then box 2 plus m square phi x phi 2 what I claim is that integral delta x 1 minus x 2 and let me put in the d 4 x 2 here. So, d 4 x 2 delta x 1 minus x 2 times this box operator which is d, d t square minus grad square plus m square on acting on this phi of x 2 these are both 2. I transfer them both to this side. So, I will get some boundary term which I am going to throw anyway. So, right. So, if I turn it once, if I turn it twice, uh, boundary terms will be of the form integrated values of delta. So, there could be one derivative of delta minus x, x 1 minus x 2 times a phi evaluated on the boundary of the domain, whatever the domain is. Uh, how do we write a domain? Some call it D. We, we will claim that this is 0, the phi is such that the asymptotically phi and its derivatives all go to 0. So, having transferred this derivative twice on this side, I will get a plus sign d 4 x 2 times box minus m box plus m squared and this time 2 uh, acting on delta of x 1 minus x 2 and phi of x 2. Sorry, this is so I this is what was untouched I am sorry. So, I want to write d 4 x 1 times box 1 plus m squared phi 1 and then from the d 4 x 2 I got this But now this became minus delta 4 so then using up the x2 integral it just became box plus uh, it just became phi of x1 And uh, you can then do a partial transfer of a derivative. So, the minus sign should eventually go. So, this is correct. So, right. So, this manipulation all leads to this basically and therefore, we are left with minus a half of this integral. But now I transfer one derivative not both to get my usual form with a plus sign. But that would change the relative sign. But which is exactly my classical action. So, modulo some sleight of hand I may have done with minus signs. This is the uh, this is the basic concept involved. Okay. So, this is the idea of effective action and we can actually carry out the manipulations and see that for free field theory such a abstractly defined process actually gives you back your original action. So, this is the grand 
definition with all this legal text attached to it because without that it does not make sense. Lot of people end up writing Hamiltonian as function of velocities. So, you have to remember that whenever you say h equal to p q dot minus l, well how does it work? Well, it works because you have to say q dot is evaluated at p's and this q dot by inverting the definition p equal to d l by d q dot. So, this has to be transferred to read q dot as function of p, In, it has to be inverted to give q dot as function of p and then substitute it here. That is when it becomes Hamiltonian, until then it is not Hamiltonian function. Okay. So, by inverting when you put it back you get the domain of dependence of gamma correctly, domain of dependence of gamma is not j. So, you have to replace j by its dependence on phi classical then you recover everything right. 